Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's TOC webcast. And as Yaz mentioned, I'm Joe Weikert, uh, co-chair of O'Reilly's Tools of Change Conference. And as a reminder, you can keep up on all the upcoming TOC events, including webcasts and podcasts, by visiting the conference website, tocon.com. And by the way, TOC Frankfurt is the next in-person event on the schedule, and it's now less than three weeks away. This year features not only the full-day TOC event on Tuesday, October 11th, but also a half-day social media workshop on Thursday the 13th. So for more information or to register, visit tocfrankfurt.com. As Yaz mentioned, for today's webcast, I'm joined by Amanda Gom. Amanda is co-founder of Digital Bindery, a business that was launched to address the growing reader frustration with low-quality ebook conversions. Amanda, welcome to the webcast. Thank you. I'll let you take it from here. Um, I wanted to start out by saying that I don't hate books, and I love how they smell and feel, and I love to turn the pages. And so I know we're all kind of caught in that uh, loving books, but also needing to go with ebooks. But I also love ebooks, so hopefully I'll be able to share that with you. Also, I'm not going to get too technical for the sake of time and also because I know we're all at different uh, levels. So, uh, but I do want to give you search terms to look for and sort of this breadcrumb idea that you can find your way through knowing some of the terms and some of the questions to ask. So, when we're talking about artisan, you know, they're starting to slap that label on everything now. You can see it on toothpaste and uh, salad dressings and little tiny loaves of bread that cost $50. But um, when, when I'm talking about artisan, I think of this rocking chair that I got from my grandma, and it's sturdy and because it was made with high-quality materials and it was handcrafted and there's attention to detail and care and thought was put into the design. And so when we talk about ebooks being artisan or artisanal, um, I'm talking about designing that traditional uh, publishing knowledge of graphic design and um, artistry along with the technical expertise of the being able to code and sort of bend the ebook to your will uh, to come up with the highest functional and aesthetic quality that we can in an ebook. And of course we have to work with the current constraints and but that's okay, we've always had to do that as publishers. You have to choose your paper type, your binding and how many colors and you have to do that based on a lot of different things. You can't ch choose to print your next book on old growth redwoods or on babies because it's not feasible financially, plus it's completely immoral. Don't make your books out of babies. So next slide. When we talk about quality, I wanted to define it um, for when, you know, going through artisan being high quality. Uh, the first thing, this is, and this is a quiz, so hopefully you'll get the quiz right. First, marketing hype. Um, it's not A, so anyway, it's not marketing hype. Uh, we have to look at fitness for use, and when we're talking about bolts or manufacturing, fitness for use is a great definition for quality, and we have to use that definition for eBooks as well. It has to actually work as an eBook. Um, also, C sort of builds on that conformance of specifications. Uh, not only does the bolt have to work, but it has to have the right threading and all that. Um, and so not only does it have to um, pass ebook standards, but it also has to work on the devices. But going beyond that, sort of beyond the basic formatting check, we go with uh, consumer-defined quality, which um, we have to decide who the customer is and what they want. So the answer is E, and I'm sure you all got it right, so that's great. Um, so who are these people and what do they want? Uh, each. Uh, product or service anywhere has two sets of customers. We have our internal customers who are uh, the editors, designers, project managers, publishers, all the people involved in creating the book, authors, um, and then we have external customers which are the readers, the reviewers, the librarians, retailers, and distributors, the people that we normally associate as customers. And those external customers have three uh, categories of demands that they want met. First are functional demands. They want it to be versatile, mobile, and robust, meaning they can read their ebook anywhere, on any device, at any time, and it will work correctly. Their content demands include correctness and readability, and readability not only meaning legible, but also uh, entertaining or informative. Then the aesthetic demands, uh, we always want our first impression to be 
pleasing, and then we want a standard of beauty throughout. The difference between, uh, I guess the additional needs that internal customers had is that we want to generate revenue and satisfy our external customers' demands. So, who cares, right? Um, if you, let's see, I was, recently there was a push out, not recently, haha, <laughs> time, um, about a year ago, I guess, when it, one of the new Kindles came out, there was this uproar on the Kindle forums about a technical thing that happened. And so, you know, we've got the publishers who are acting as gatekeepers, but we've also got all of these other people that are involved in this gatekeeper role, reviewers, social media, retailers, we're selling to each other and we're, we're passing along information to each other. And people that are upset about this are not subtle or quiet about it. So if you're um, really trying to meet their needs, there are ways to go out and, and get that information, and I would encourage you to do that. And remember that our book doesn't have to only get past our internal acquisitions process, but past these other people. And they realize that they have other options. So when they open up their book, your book and it's ugly and hard to read, they'll know that they have other places to go to get stuff. So we don't want them to do that. So this is my uh, spokes of artisanal quality slide that tells us all the things that uh, we needed to get the artisan quality. Uh, we're developing our uh, quality assurance process at Digital Bindery, and we needed to have some concrete definitions. The idea was you can't improve what you don't measure, and you can't measure what you don't define. So we wanted to define each of these aspects of um, quality for um, as it related, relates to an ebook. So we're going to go through each of these books, and I'll talk about it, and I'll spend a lot of time on aesthetics because I think that's what people are really concerned about. So we've got artisanal content, and this is kind of what you already do. We're talking about our content being timely and correct and informative or entertaining, but also needs to be value added um, despite this idea that ebooks are free to make, which someone asked me, are ebooks really cheaper? And I said, well, yeah, but not as cheaper as you think they are. Um, but the risk has to be weighed regardless of medium. You can't just put a bunch of poopy stuff out on the book. I shouldn't say poopy, sorry. Um, poor quality content and expect people to pay money for it. That doesn't make any sense and it's not going to happen. Okay, artisanal performance. We're talking about conformance and serviceability here. Um, this is the technical requirements. This is the basic formatting check again. Uh, it, this is the fitness for use definition. To go a little bit further into that, you need to make sure that it's, your ebook is looking good on as many devices as you can. And if you haven't looked at your ebook on any other devices other than maybe Adobe Digital Editions or some software that you can download on your uh, desktop computer, I would um, strongly urge you to go check out some e-readers and, and how your stuff is looking. Um, when we conform to device limitations, the idea is that we have EPUB and MOBI standards, kind of this large umbrella, uh, and they're determined by the IDPF, which is the International Digital Publishing Forum, in the case of EPUB, and then in the case of MOBI, it's decided by MOBI Pocket, which is owned by Amazon. And then after that, we have another sort of step down to the e-readers, and they decide which of those standards they're going to accept and which they're not. Just kind of like web browsers, how everything looks different on Internet Explorer and Chrome and uh, Firefox, so it's the same kind of thing. They'll decide what, how they're going to uh, display certain codes. And then prepare, preparation for technological advances. We want our code to be sleek and easy to modify, easy to understand if we have to pass it on to someone else. So next we move on to reliability, durability, and continuity. Uh, you need to know the probability of malfunction within a certain time period. If you think about cars, they come with a warranty that's 60,000 miles or six years or whatever it is nowadays, uh, and that's because their, their product is designed to function really well without a lot of fixing during that time. They can, they can test and foresee the, that. And we all need to understand, as we look at the stack of floppy disks or at our old 8-track tapes and cassettes, that technology marches on without our consent, and we need to know that your e-books, maybe not soon, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but eventually they will be out of date, and you need to know 
ahead of time how you're going to handle the economic impact of depreciation. And if you are intending to sell your ebooks for a long time, then um, you want to be able to have them work for a long time. Okay, this is the slide where I say just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I'm just going to leave it at that. Just keep it in mind. You're going to add the soundtrack. Are you really? Should you? Do people really want to hear the soundtrack in this particular book? Maybe not. So just keep that in mind. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And remember, remember the lessons we learned from the late 90s with websites and those terrible, like, blinking, light, flashing words and all that stuff. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Okay. DRM. Um, so I, uh, at the uh, recent conference, I asked who, uh, in a group of publishers, how many of you have, pub have pirated a book? And I was really surprised. I thought there'd be like one or two sheepishly raising their hands, but all of them are like, me! And so if you're thinking who, um, um, you know, why, that if you have pirated a book, why did you do it? There are lots of reasons. Um, one is because you wanted it on a different device. You wanted to loan it to a friend. You, the formatting was terrible. I had this happen to me. I bought a, a book from a publisher online, from an e-book, and it was so bad that I actually went and, and pirated the fan-created copy. Don't tell anybody, but um, that was um, because it was so difficult to read. But I still paid for it first. Um, and then was it priced too high for the value of the content, or are you just inherently evil? And probably you're not evil, uh, and probably the people that are pirating books have those same kind of issues. And remember, if uh, you DRM your stuff, it's going to take a hacker a matter of minutes to get around it. So uh, in my opinion and opinion of a lot of other people, uh, DRM is not the best option to protect your content. But there are ways to do it by being uh, smart about what you do. Okay. Now we're going to talk about aesthetics. The first thing about aesthetics is that we have uh, hardware constraints. So um, this, this is an example, one example of how e-ink can work. There are other ways that it works, but this is a pretty standard example. So each of these uh, is a, a pearl or pixel that contains uh, black and white molecules inside of it. And when it's given a charge, it can display um, black, white, and gray. And uh, so what you need to do is imagine a gymnasium full of sixth graders. And the girls are on the right and the boys are on the left. And when I blow the whistle, they're going to switch spots. And they're going to ram into each other and they're going to trip and fall and bonk. And uh, eventually they'll get over to the other side. And we can practice and practice and get faster and faster, but it's never going to be instantaneous. And that's where e-ink is right now. It's not instantaneous. So we don't have um, video because the frame rate is too slow. And we should limit our page turns if we can. So adding blank pages is frustrating for the reader. Uh, and you should avoid it if, if it makes sense for your book to be able to do that. Our software constraints, this is where we start talking about the device control, the interpretation of code that we talked about before, which the standards they want to Im, uh, implement, and uh, the fonts that they have available. And I'll talk a little bit more about fonts and embeddability later. Um, <clears throat> with the users, users can control a lot of things when it comes to the um, the book, and we know that, and that's part of the problem uh, with designing it. It's hard to anticipate what they're going to do. They can control um, everything from uh, what font they're reading into the portrait versus landscape screen adjustment arrangement. So my theory is that you set everything anyway. You don't give up just because someone else can change it. Uh, my theory is that if the book is beautiful and legible, the desire to mess with the settings will lessen and they'll um, be less prone to change it because they can't read it. Um, although there are always the people that say, my favorite font is Courier, so I don't know. Okay. Um, next slide. Okay. <laughs> um, the font is what is something that we can control. Uh, 
uh, for font face, we're talking about uh, should we do Palatino or Arial, um, we can uh, embed, we have the ability to embed fonts into our files. But I would recommend against it because um, it's uh, not usable by most readers. I think it's the better practice to understand the fonts that they are most likely to read it on and, and work within those constraints. We can change the relative size of fonts, uh, meaning when they increase the, the body of the text, we can also have the uh, headings increase so that we can retain hierarchy. We control capitalization. I think if the day ever comes that we don't have control over capitalization, I think that I might just cry a lot that day. Um, but also we can control style. Uh, and then this is actually a little bit of code under the serif sans serif monospace that you would see in your style sheet in your CSS. Uh, you can list different um, different uh, font families to choose from, and the reader will start at the beginning and go to the end of the list, choosing the one that they ha have uh, the ability to do. And then at the end, you always list the generic, and that will supply whatever default it has for that generic. Um, it's also important that we uh, change out curly quotes, angle brackets, uh, and any other weird uh, characters because particularly with angle brackets, the e-reader will uh, either interpret the angle bracket as part of the code that's malformed or they'll display some kind of garbagey um, letters. And you've seen, I'm sure you've seen this on web pages, someone will use a curly quote and they'll have some kind of like blank squares or nonsense where there should be uh, an apostrophe. Um, and my um, uh, colleague pointed out just yesterday that a lot of the uh, e-readers prefer that you use a Unicode shorthand rather than the HTML character entity, and that may um, blow over your minds, but anyway, it, but some of you will get it, and hooray, uh, you are my brothers and sisters. So um, let me give you an example. It, for an M dash, sometimes an M dash doesn't uh, display correctly, and uh, you can use two things. One is the HTML character identity, which would be an ampersand, M-D-A-S-H, semicolon. And actually, I can put this into the group chat. Ha. Huh. There. Or you can use the Unicode, which is uh, what they would prefer, which is that. The ampersand and then octothorpe 8212, semicolon. <clears throat> I also wanted to uh, just from a standpoint of being grammatically correct, tell you some, about something called a zero width joiner, which is really important to me personally. It's like my personal pet peeve. When you have a, an M dash or something that shouldn't be separated from the word that it follows, if you put the zero width joiner between it, then it won't, and you can have something that looks nice. Okay. So here is a list of uh, fonts that are available on the different devices. And it's, I really believe strongly that if you're going to create ebooks, you should know what you're working with. And so if, uh, remember that you can list things in, in um, the order that you prefer. So uh, there's one, I was thinking of a tricky example. If you really, really, really wanted your ebook to be displayed in Rockwell for some reason, um, uh, you notice that the Kobo Reader and the Nook both have a Massis as one of their uh, as one of their font choices. So if you were to list your fonts, you would want to put Rockwell first, because Kobo Reader would pick Rockwell and then go to Amasis if it didn't have Rockwell, if that makes sense. I hope it does. Okay. Uh, I really like the chapter break part of uh, any book when I think, I feel like the Chapter heading is where we can really brand the book and, and make someone feel like, yeah, this book is just like the print book. I, it feels familiar and at home. Um, and so we can control when the, the page breaks. Uh, I read a poetry book, ebook one time that had no page breaks and no headings, and it was really, really awful. The poetry was really good, so I tried really hard to get through it. And you may have seen this before. Um, so. Forcing your page breaks is the new recto, of making it clear that this is uh, where we begin. Um, for chapter uh, headings and things where you don't have to worry about text reflow, I feel like images are an okay option. Um, if you look 
<clears throat> at uh, the top example that's text um, and the uh, example of the chapter Gloria is an image and we had to make a choice if we wanted um, that chapter 16 to be readable. Uh, on smartphones it's not terribly readable, but we decided that we wanted that aesthetic anyway. So there are these um, trade-offs to make when it comes to uh, what's possible and what you want, what is most important to you. Um, we can control justification, again, the relative size, and we can add horizontal rules, which are sweet because they don't add any bulk to your um, book. They're just a code, and they, you can do things like put borders on them, change their width and their color, and all kinds of things. So uh, the publisher also gets to control our images. And so we can control the size with, um, I spent a long time crying over not being able to control the size of Moby, so I thought I'd add this tip. Uh, you can see that when you add when you add your reference to where the image is, you have to put, you know, it's in my images folder and it's called picture.jpg, um, and you have to put SRC before that. And instead of doing SRC with Moby's, you can do HISRC, and then you can add the height and width and uh, not have to be so sad and crying like me. Um, remember that a lot of the e-readers have a limited amount of colors. There are 16 shades of gray. That's what that uh, block of color gray is showing you. Um, with my Photoshop tip of the day, if you go to File, Save for Web and Devices, you can choose which colors are going to be displayed. And, you, you know, we want to continue to display the, to retain the color information for those of us that read on LCD screens, um, but we can still decide how the user is going to con uh, compress that image and display it if we don't uh, decide that it'll do that for us. And we can also do placement. I guess I should add an InDesign tip of the day. Um, if you're going, if you're converting your eBooks from InDesign, your images are going to get into the wrong place unless you anchor your images. So, anchor your images. <laughs> okay. And then here's an example of a cover that uh, one on the left-hand side is just how it was displayed from the print version, just naturally. And then the second uh, cover is an optimized cover. And so you can see that the sizes are different. Um, just because you chose to print your book in a six by nine for a lot of really great reasons doesn't mean that your cover needs to be, for your ebook, needs to be in six by nine. In fact, the uh, screen dimensions on an e-reader are not the six inches by nine inches. So um, you need to uh, format it uh, 600 by 800 is um, the screen dimensions of most standard e-readers. <coughs> and so you can see <coughs> not only did we change like the um, negative text, but also the um, chair itself, the throne that's in that image, it actually has less data in the optimized version, but we were able to choose which data was retained instead of just letting it up, uh, be up to the e-reader. Okay, we also control tables, and for tables, they can be really, really tricky. They can become illegible really quickly, and so there, you might need to have some creative reimagining for your platform and uh, really think outside the box and, and remember that you need to serve the content, and um, the most important thing is that the information is there and the reader can, can get it, that you, it's, that's more important than retaining the exact print layout. And there are other ways to do that. You can use fixed layout EPUB, especially if you know all of your um, readers are going to be using an iPad. Uh, you can use a PDF that's not reflowable, but you know, if you're doing only tables, it's, it's an option. Um, but then additionally, you can provide downloadable content, maybe create a table with truncated information, and more is available online when they can look at it in a larger format or print it out. <clears throat> um, we also get to control the layout with uh, letting and justification. Um, I know the uh, Kobo reader, at least, was uh, going to allow just uh, letting adjustments, which I think, why, <laughs> why? But oh well, that's you know the serving the the need of the reader to uh, have control. That's okay. Um, but uh, as far as justification goes. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about ragged right versus full justification, or uh, left justified, I guess, with the ragged right. Um, 
as far as reading goes, readability, uh, when we have a ragged right, the side on the right is ragged. Um, it's actually easier for our eye to find the, the line. Uh, there's less cicadic jumps there. It's easier to um, keep in place, and so it's easier to read and comprehend. And so when you just full justify a book, you actually save a lot of paper. You end up shrinking up your um, paper usage. And so tradition has sort of led us to always justify it fully. But for reading purposes, um, you, it's better not to. And for e-reading, there's not a whole lot of uh, bonuses to saving paper. Um, so I, I like to keep them uh, just left justified, and I think it's the better option, especially when you look at um, how it's displayed. The e-readers have a hard time with hyphenation, and they will often bump the longer words down, so you end up with this really odd um, margin, right-hand margin anyway, right-hand, yes, right, ha. Um, and uh, the, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you go to Best Buy or anywhere that has um, uh, e-readers, you can look at their um, manuals that they have on the books, and they're all full justified, which makes me laugh because they end up looking really terrible. But anyway, they're not publishers, so that's okay. They don't have to be artisan uh, manual makers. Um, so then when we talk about margins, there are a lot of people that read e-books because uh, they're visually impaired and they, they want the larger font size. So that's where margins really come in and justification. Uh, for justification, as you enlarge the font size, often it will end up with these terrible gaps. The kerning just goes crazy. It doesn't, um, it doesn't do a very good job with it. So you'll end up with um, two words on a line and, and spaced out really crazy. Um, uh, so another reason not to go full justification. But with the margins, there are two ways to measure margins. You can do it absolutely with uh, points or pixels, and you can do it relatively with the MEM um, measurement. <clears throat> when you do it relatively, then as your font size increases, your margins also increase, which makes it, again, really difficult for people who need to read it in a very large size, because as the margins increase, the, uh, the, the place for the text to be shrinks. And so you get like one word wrapped around. And when you go back to that hardware limitation of flipping pages very slowly, <clears throat> you end up with frustrated readers. Um, and that's speaking to people that have uh, visual impairment. That's very frustrating for them. So I would suggest absolute measurements for your margins. Um, we can control portrait versus landscape. And we can make columns using floated divs. So something to look up if you don't know what that is. Artisanal availability. <clears throat> Our readers want to read it anytime, anywhere. And so if you look at what readers, um, e-readers are uh, out there and what they read, uh, most of them will either read EPUB and MOE, like PCs, notebooks, netbooks, smartphones, <clears throat> all kinds of computers. They can have software for, to read either, either format, so that's fine. Um, but then when you look at the, the majority of e-readers, they will either read their own proprietary format and EPUB or EPUB only. So if you're going to re reach the largest number of devices, you need to go with EPUB. But if you really, really want a Kindle only book, we can look at this slide. Um, and this was uh, taken from a Mintel uh, research report from April of 2011, um, and it, it asked people that had, within the last six months, um, used their device to uh, access a digital book. And there were a lot of Kindle readers, so they were the largest single user. But then you have your iPad, Nook, Sony, Kobo reader, and your other e-readers, also a huge chunk. And so if you want a chance at the largest piece of the pie, you need to make sure that you are converting both formats. Um, so every step along the way of your process, from the author to the reader, needs to have the same uh, vision of quality that you want to have for your print book. And so if you want to um, decide that uh, you don't really care if your reader 
thinks that you're kind of crappy when it comes to design, but you can skip that step or, or skimp on it. But when you really want them to think that you've put your time into it and that you care about the product as much as they, as you want them to, then you need to remember that each of these things are important and make a plan that includes each of them so that you can spend enough time and resources on them. And I just wanted to say also about the ebook time, if you're doing uh, your digital production in-house, uh, you need to remember that your digital uh, department needs a budget for staying up with current trends and, um, and uh, education. So, um, so that's our whole spoke wheel thing. <clears throat> and this is a checklist that uh, we've developed to, that has everything you need to create a great um, ebook. And it's also available at um, the, uh, our website at digitalbindery.com slash artisan dash checklist where you can print it off and it'll tell you a little bit about each of those um, items. They'll just call your attention to a few things. The basic formatting check, uh, make sure it can be re read on the readers and, and conforms to specifications. Uh, the complete formatting check goes a little bit further and make sure that you approximate the print um, version that uh, all of the inline formatting is correct, metadata is correct for the title. And then um, with uh, interactivity, uh, it's important that if you have foot or endnotes that it links to the footnote and then back to the, the content, and that can be tricky. So, you know, just checking all of those links, making sure that they're correct. Um, graphical elements, uh, I, it's really, I am um, very uh, passionate about the idea that we need to optimize our images and not just can crush them down and shove them in, um, and that they can be beautiful. Uh, and, you know, even uh, chapter headings and all that. So um, anyway, a checklist for you. And then that is all I have for you today. Well, Amanda, that's uh, terrific information. And I've got to say, you may have set the record for the most uh, audience questions ever for one of our webcasts. So <laughs> take a breath and let me roll up to the top here and see how many we can get through here. Okay. All right. So, um, Let's see, Agatha asks, uh, according to my distributors, Apple has the highest standards for preparing content for EPUB. Can you verify this, and what makes it so, if it's true? That Apple has the highest standards? Yes. Um, I, uh, they require um, specific formatting checks, like the it has to pass uh, EPUB checker or something. Um, and uh, they also, allow, I, I don't know if, if they have the higher standards is correct, but they allow really cool things that you can do in the eBooks. Uh, they, it's almost like EPUB 2.5, so you can add media and different things, which I, I read the EPUB 3 standards like almost every day and I get excited about it and I like tell my friends, look what you can do. And so they are already letting some of that stuff in and that makes me really <laughs> excited. But um, anyway, uh, you know, they have some technical standards that you have to get by, but there are other uh, places that require, that have really tight standards too, like with Kobo, they're really specific on what character sets you can use and what you can't. So I think um, they're, they have also really tight guidelines as far as um, distribution agreements. They're kind of not my favorite. <laughs> mm, okay. Anyway. All right. Okay, next that. question from Larry is, uh, what, what do you think stops people from publishing their books as websites instead of as an ebook format? Uh, it's hard to monetize. I think that's the, probably the number one reason is because um, there are a few um, places that, that you can do that, um, but uh, Amazon doesn't sell them. And when you're talking about uh, big retail elephants in the room, that's them. Um, so. I think uh, it's a monetizing thing for the most part. Also, um, people really like to take their book to the beach or on the subway, and they don't necessarily want to bring their laptop or their connected device. And it's, it's one more step removed from that print experience. So I think there are a couple of things at play there. So uh, let me ask you just a follow-up to that, though, because I wonder if there's a future there anyhow. So could it be that at one point in the future we might see the ability to sell content on websites um, through either a third-party provider or some sort of a, another enabler 
um, especially if there's an easy way to pull down and have that uh, local copy available even if you don't have a connection. Yeah, um, and you know, that's, we're already, when we're looking at like HTML5 and being able to sort of preload everything, I think that there's some, some things that could go that way. Um, but uh, again, when we see them struggle with newspapers and trying to figure out how to monetize their online content, it's, we're not there yet at all, and the, the way to do it hasn't been figured out. I think that um, eventually we're going to have like brain implants, and then we'll be able to download it all, and then we can read it, and maybe even uh, trigger some kind of hallucination that we're actually reading a physical book. Well, I can't wait for those days, especially the hallucina hallucination. That's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Okay, next question. Um, let's see. I'm a publisher. I can work my way around InDesign. I'm in the middle of learning how to move InDesign books over to EPUB and Mobi. Here's my question. Do I need to become a coder? I think you do, but don't be afraid. Um, so with – and InDesign is getting – so much better. The jump from CS4 to CS5 as far as uh, creating good EPUBs was huge. Um, and so it's getting better, and maybe um, it'll get better and better, but you're always going to want to add your own uh, unique things to it and have some more control. Um, and so I think that uh, it will really help to be able to break it down get inside, see what Adobe did to your stuff, because it is your stuff, and um, it, it, at the very least, you want to add some different metadata. And I know there are programs that allow you to do that um, without having to go into the code, but it's not, you're not coding like C or uh, Python or anything. This is really a lot like um, websites. Uh, so uh, don't be afraid. and. Um, you know, crack it open and see what you can see. And I, I'm guessing that you will be less intimidated than you think you're going to be. Yeah, I like your point about, um, you know, at least it'll allow you to see what's going on and have a better understanding. I think that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. So back when you were on, uh, I think, an aesthetic slide, you had some recommendation about fonts. And the question we have is, do those recommendations about fonts hold true for EPUB 3? Um, well, uh, no. <laughs> so with EPUB 3, so exciting, um, the font embeddability stuff is way more advanced and really cool. And so when EPUB 3 comes out, I'm going to be embedding fonts like crazy, and you won't even be able to stop me. Um, but uh, for now, uh, embeddability is really difficult. With Kindle, you have to actually buy a program to um, be able to embed fonts, and with a lot of other programs, you actually have to root your device. And I know that e-reader people tend to be um, tech savvy, but I don't think they're like root your nook tech savvy. Um, and then uh, as far as what these, um, let me see if I can, the um, artisan artisanal aesthetics with the e-reader fonts, um, those will change with every single uh, e-reader device that comes out. They'll have different ones. Um, and as far as like the specific um, like font family choices, those aren't uh, necessarily good recommendations. Those are just like random thoughts that I had. So uh, as far as like the Palatino Times by Classic, I would more go with um, like making sure that if I wanted a Masses versus Light Classic in on the Nook, I would make sure I put one of those first. That's probably the only or if you really love Baskerville or something, putting that in there um, in, those, in that order. Okay. All right, next question. Do you think the PDF is still so widespread because editors and designers like to create a fixed and predictable format? And do you think it is possible to create a complex page design and still make it usable in EPUB or Kindle format? I totally think that, the first one. And then the second one, um, I think simplicity – oh, I should explain. I totally think that people are stuck on PDF because of, it gives you the most control. And I think right now uh, for setting up really complex things, it's not necessarily hard to do. It's just not very legible on the size that we have to work with. And if you know that everyone's going to have a Kindle DX, like if you're doing um, textbooks and you know that the majority of your readers are using the larger format of e-reader, then uh, go ahead and, and complex it away, but um, 
right now, uh, not knowing what e-reader they're going to use and not knowing um, how they're necessarily going to um, display the different complex items, um, it's really, it's important to try it out, I guess, is the bottom line. Um, you can do complex, um, but you have to know that it's going to turn out the way you want to because it be, can be such an embarrassing disaster. Right, it doesn't right. Okay. All right, next up, speaking of fonts, uh, let's see, we practice creating a dual edition of our books in um, print and an EPUB. Since we can output the EPUB from InDesign, should we not include embedding the fonts at export and allow the e-readers to decide which font to use? That's what I would choose, and that's what I, when I do do stuff from InDesign, I don't um, export the fonts. A lot of times I will also use a, um, an external style sheet that I've already mapped out. Uh, that's another option in um, in design when exporting. Um, and uh, I saw we were talking about XML stuff, and um, I think that's uh, right now you can create a, an ebook in XML, at least in EPUB. You can use XML instead of HTML. Um, but it, it looks like for EPUB three, we're going to go away from that, which is interesting. But um, also, as far as archiving your books to make them sort of future-proof, I would definitely recommend um, having your, any converter that you, or service into internal or external, uh, also um, give you an XML file so that you can um, sort of have that for archiving sake. And if it's already, XML's already in your workflow, then I think you're fabulous and doing well. So. Okay. Next question's from Agatha, one of my favorite TOC webcast attendees, Agatha asks, uh, well, she says, my, my big headache right now is how to make e-books of poetry um, mm. books, and the problem, of course, is because of the versification. What are some possible solutions for making it happen for them to get into e-book formats? Uh, was it versification? Yes. Or div okay. Yes. Yeah, um, I did a poetry book um, for uh, Dot to dot Oregon with Oregon Press, and it was uh, challenging um, because of the reflow situation uh, and line breaks. And so you have to just kind of come to grips with the fact that you're going to have line breaks and work with indents and negative indents so that you can um, have the text wrap and reflow correctly, work with uh, forced line breaks, do a lot of um, the zero width joiners and different things to keep things together or non-breaking spaces um, and different things to uh, really get as close as you can. And after that, it is just you have to let it go, let it go. <laughs> okay. All right. Next up, Jay asks, can you discuss how HTML5 and CSS3 will affect EPUB3? HTML5 and CSS3? Um, so EPUB 3 has uh, a lot of the same improvements that HTML5 has already adopted, um, like the uh, media embeddability, um, and it, it takes some of the CSS3 stuff as well. I, I really am liking it, what I see. Um, you can go to the IDPF uh, web page and see all of the specifications that, are, that they're they're setting now. We're getting closer, I think, to the final version, and um, it, it's very similar to um, HTML5. So, yeah, it's close. Okay. All righty. Uh, okay, next one we have is, let's see, we have books that require style where the formatting is a lot of the value, like children's books. Word yeah. content is 10 to 20 per page. Think Old MacDonald. Um, how can books be formatted to preserve the graphical appeal? Well, I really, for um, for children's books, I like what they've done um, with the Nook Color and the iPad um, a lot. I mean, e-ink is, I mean, you can have, like, isn't Ferdinand the Bull line drawings? That was great, and so black and white will work, um, and, and for some books it will, but uh, it's important to um, set your landscape versus portrait mode. You can set that kind of thing. Um, and also uh, just making sure that it's the right device for your product. Um, and 
if you want it on ebook, that's great, but maybe there's a different version for it, a, a mobile version of the story. Um, but, you know, going back to that, um, just because you can doesn't mean you should thing. The experience of mother or the father, or caregiver, and child sitting quietly reading a book, the anticipation of page turns and all of those things that can be put into ebooks is really valuable. And I don't want us to think that everything has to be flashy and jingly and um, have all kinds of uh, bells and whistles in it to to be that same experience. Yeah. So, okay. And since I'm the moderator, I can cheat and ask you my own question here. You got me thinking. Do, do, do you think that the uh, highly rumored Amazon tablet is going to change any of this much? In other words, are they still going to stick with Mobi, or would they change and maybe embrace EPUB, or you know, any any speculation? Yeah. Well, a crystal ball of future telling. Um, I would. I, okay, if I were Amazon, I totally would go EPUB. Um, I think it's great that Amazon's jumping into the ring just because I think the iPad needs a competitor. Um, and, and I know there are Android tablets out there, the Galaxy and all that stuff, but um, I think we need somebody with some big money to back it. So I'm really excited that they're doing that. Um, at the same time, with a lot of publishers, I uh, kind of don't always give them the benefit of the doubt, and I am suspicious. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah. But uh, if I were them, I would go EPUB because uh, it, Mobi drives me nuts, and it's so much less helpful <laughs> than uh, EPUB is even now. And if they're just going to stick with this and reinvent the wheel for themselves every single generation of ebook, I think it's ridiculous. The IDPF is a consortium, conglomeration, a big, huge group of all kinds of people, and even you, too, can join the IDPF um, and, and have your say in what's going to happen with these standards. Um, and so Amazon was, I don't know who's there, but they're, you know, kind of less uh, communicative than um, some other, the people that do EPUB. So. Yeah, well, I, I totally agree with you, and since you're up in their neck of the woods, sort of, maybe you can go up and try to I will. I'll be like, how yeah. to do this, right? No. Yeah, exactly. All right, so <laughs> back, to the, uh, back to the audience questions here. Next one, I find the big problem with e-books is that they are harder to browse, especially for technical and reference books. And by the way, I, I totally agree with this. Any hints on how to improve or work around that? Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, uh, it's totally hard <laughs> to browse. Um, one of the things that I have found when I am reading ebooks that's, that I need references are uh, internal navigation within your book, uh, and that's easier with touch screens than with the other, you know, like the non-touch screen items. But still, um, kind of trying to anticipate where they're going to want to go and making that as easy as possible. Um, having linked indices, having um, uh, internal cross-referencing and that kind of thing um, is uh, about as good as we can get right now, Have, making sure your table of contents is uh, correct and um, uh, readable by your e-reading devices so that they can pull that up within um, the e-reader software itself. You know, all those things just make it easy on them. Um, and uh, e-ink is getting faster and faster. The people that work on it are brilliant geniuses, and they're gonna, it's going to get there quicker than if I were working on it, for instance. But, yeah, yeah, and you know what, re related to this question, there's, a, there's another TOC product uh, that's coming out, should be out next month, so later in October, uh, from Peter Myers. And, and anybody who has been involved in, in each of the TOC webcasts, you might know Pete Myers' name. But he's got uh, an e-book, and it's actually a rich product that he's going to be releasing a free version of. Uh, it's called Breaking the Page, and I would just say keep an eye out for that because this is one of the things that he's talked a lot about as well and is going to be covered in there. So anyhow, just for the folks on the, on the call here to, uh, to be aware of that. Um, next question, why can't I just take a page layout in InDesign, make sure it's the right aspect ratio and size for, say, iPad, make that grouped object a single object, and lay out the book, uh, the ebook that way? Um, mostly because of reflow issues. Uh, if you're going to do a fixed layout EPUB like with um, for the iPad, uh, you can. Um, but if someone 
if, they, if you want to allow the reader to have the controls that they're used to by being able to flip their iPad upside down or sideways and zoom in and, and have the text reflow and still look good, then you're at leg drought if you do it that way. Um, so I guess it's just, do you want to seize control or do you want to allow the reader the control that they want and go okay, that way? So there's that trade-off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Next question about your company. Does Digital Bindery create multiple EPUBs optimized for different devices or one EPUB for all? We do one EPUB for all generally unless there's some really specific reason. Um, we, there are uh, different things like the Nook supports drop caps, but not all do, so we try to um, work around the drop cap situation by creating it a different way. Or like uh, small caps, that's an easy one to explain. Um, not all, uh, let's see, I think I have a drop cap example from um, a Kindle, and Kindle does not do drop caps. Um, and, and so we did kind of a sneaky, tricky thing to create that, um, the drop cap using spans and smaller sizes and just typing in um, capital letters. So um, when we are looking at um, the EPUB, we, we do one robust format, and then we test it on the different devices, and if it's not looking good, then we change something. And we've had to do that a few times. Um, different devices will display uh, the way things float or um, uh, negative indents and that kind of thing differently. Um, so usually, though, there's a workaround or some kind of ingenious way to make it work as best we can on all of the devices. Yeah, it's probably all those clever workarounds that need to be documented in one place that could be a terrific resource, right? Yeah. <laughs> then be out of a job, it'd be sweet. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next question. One of my distributors has recommended I convert to the following formats, PDF, PDB, EPUB, and MOBI. Do these cover most of the devices, or can I narrow the list down further? I think you kind of addressed PDF. that with that one slide, right? Yeah, PDF, PDB, EPUB, EPUB and, MOBI. and MOBI. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like they want your money. Um, I don't. PDB is for is that Blackberries or I'm not sure Black actually. Or Palm. It's one of those. But um, they can also that read e peanut format that they had. That peanut press format is what it was. Yeah. Uh, well. I don't know. Regardless, they can also read EPUBs um, and PDF. Uh, I guess you could do PDF. I mean, you can do that yourself though from. InDesign, and um, but uh, I, I personally don't see the need to go PDB um, and PDF. I guess if somebody wants to buy PDF, that's okay. But then that's really easy to just print, and I don't know. I, but I it would does say, seem like if you had PDF, EPUB, and Mobi, you're pretty dug on, well covered, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and I just saw someone said PDB was the Nook format. The format okay. now yep. it's EPUB, so. It sounds like outmoded format. Okay. All right. All right. Next up, do you see potential ebook applications for subscription, uh, cloud-based font services along the lines of Typekit? Font services? Is that what you said? Yes, for subscription font services along the lines of Typekit. I think <laughs> that would be cloud-based. You know, I love publishers for their love of fonts, but I don't know that everybody has that and are willing to pay for it. Um, so while, you know, maybe that might be a way of getting around licensing issues with embedded fonts, uh, I, you know, I was thinking today, I really wish that we could get those numbers on how many people are buying Amazon's um, ability to embed the font app, um, because if we could see those numbers, we can see how many people are caring about it, um, but I don't know those numbers, and um, so I'm not sure. Uh, how much they care about it. I think like the Google font thing and, you know, it's all, it's getting more cloudy and I like clouds, <laughs> but I'm not really yeah. sure. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. By the way, I saw going back to that um, uh, breaking the page, there was a question about where can I get information on that. Just so folks know, it's not out yet. We don't have a catalog page loaded. We will shortly, and I'll be Twittering and you'll see it up on the radar page too. Um, but that, that link that just appeared in the group chat window is, a, is a, as good a place as any right now for what's available. 
So next question, and I really like this one, any advice on using color, especially considering that different readers will be using the same EPUB file on grayscale ink devices and on color nooks and iPads? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I, yeah, so for color, uh, it's important that you use uh, colors that are distinct enough from each other that when they appear in grayscale, they uh, are distinguishable. So um, that's easy to check by just uh, putting your stuff in black and white and, and looking at it, or looking at it on an e-reader. Um, the other thing is, uh, like I said, with the save for web and devices with Photoshop, you can, uh, and there are, I'm sure, other ways to do it with other programs or other ways within Photoshop, but um, you can decide which colors are gonna be shown. Um, I've had great uh, uh, results with spot color, uh, you know, just any spot color, like for drop caps or uh, horizontal rules, uh, that where it's not near anything else and it's just one color anyway, um, where it's, uh, it works just fine on uh, the e ink unless it's too light and it doesn't have enough contrast with the background, but um, then it really pops in the LCD version, so. Um, and with our covers and, and different things, we always keep them in color. We don't convert them to black and white, and I would recommend that uh, even like the, the black and white nooks still have the LCD screen for searching in the store through the covers. And so to remove the color um, data, I think is not taking advantage of the technology very well. Mm -hmm. Okay. This next one I think is somewhat tongue-in-cheek from Agatha. She asks, why would we need a company like Digital Bindery? As a publisher, I'm also very, very particular about the artisanal approach to e-publishing. So what can you offer us over and above what we're currently trying to put into our e-publications? Uh, <clears throat> honestly, the thing that I, I think from a publisher standpoint, why you want a company like Digital Bindery is because uh, we dedicate time and money to staying on top of trends and, you know, we're going to be rolling out our EPUB 3 services sooner than um, most publishers are going to be able to get that stuff together uh, just because uh, that's what we do. So it's just like any outsourcing. Um, you have to spend the money in-house or you have to spend the money out, out, out house nice. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it's... Um, it's really, you know, what, where, where do you want to spend your resources? If it's really important to you that you design it well, then, you know, keep it in-house and make sure you have uh, the, you, that you dedicate that budget to um, buying e-readers to test it on um, and uh, staying up to date with the, the new technologies. Um, but, yeah, I think that's the, when you're going with an external service for anything, editing or um, printing, that's just yeah, something that you have to decide for your business model. And, you know, you look back at publishing back in the day, you know, like Gutenberg the day, um, the publisher wrote the book and set the book and printed the book and sold the book. And we just kind of gradually uh, horizontally disintegrated. And uh, so uh, because we specialize so much in what we do. And so um, just a specialization is required. It's more difficult to keep that um, technical, those technical chops in-house sometimes. Yep, yep, makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I saw it just and in the... And to me, digital binary, which is great. That's right. <laughs> um, there was one other little note here I wanted to go back to in the group chat window. Uh, oh, yeah, don't forget that designers also need to check how the design looks, the cover design, uh, looks in thumbnail view. We've made it possible yeah. for our front covers to be visible, even in that size, which, you know, to me, that's one of the things I know at O'Reilly we've talked a lot about is that our, our cover design as it exists in print is great for that format, but mm -hmm. it may not be optimal for the future where, it, you know, it's dominated by thumbnails. So what's your opinion there? What do you, what do, you do to kind of solve that problem? Well, we try to shrink it down to, I think, 12% is our um, shrinker rate uh, to make sure that it's readable. You know, we can future-proof things to a certain extent, but to get caught up in it too much is just going to be paralyzation. Um, and so uh, I, I think we're doing okay with the standards we have with, 
you know, 12 percent of the size is still legible, that the hierarchy is still obvious, you know, can you see what's the most important? Is it the title, the author, or the image? And then second and third. And so you have that three uh, group hierarchy. If that's still visible um, on the small size, then you're set. Then you need to check it in black and white to make sure that all of your colors aren't so close to the same uh, gray that it's all just a blob. That quick question on, quick follow up on that 12% uh, of what size? Is that the original print size or what? Yeah, the original print size. Okay, gotcha. That's just kind of a, but I mean, you know, you can figure out like one and a half inches by an inch or something. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I'm no good in real life. All right. Well, we, we are running out of time here. I see one last question from another one of my favorites in the TOC crowd, somebody named Kat Meyer, and her question is, <laughs> how awesome is Amanda? And I say hugely awesome. So. Uh, Amanda Gom, thank you so much for everything today. It was a terrific uh, webcast. And audience, thank you so much as well. Great questions, a lot of wonderful back and forth here. Um, if you know anybody who missed this, we'll have a recorded version up as an archive here before too long. And again, be sure to check out TOCCon.com for all the future uh, upcoming events that we've got around TOC. So thanks again, folks, and we'll talk to you soon.